I am wrecked in the Holy Spirit. Uh, when I saw Scott Holbert go to the back and get a tissue, and I'm like, Pfft. and then I look over and I see Miguel with a tissue, and I'm like, okay, bro, go get yourself a tissue. And uh, oh my goodness. So I want to thank you guys. I want to tell you that it is so good to be with family. And, and I, want to, I just want to tell you what a, what a blessing it is to be a, a part of the body of Christ. And you know, this body of Christ is built because of commonality, not because of our sports teams or our, or, or our job or anything like that. It's because we've made a commitment uh, to, to Jesus Christ. We have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. And in part of that comes our, our commitment to, to lay in foundational stones of the faith. And we've been talking about this series. It's 12 weeks. It's the God Is series. And, and the Holy Spirit put it on our heart very clear from the beginning. He said, build a foundation based upon rock based upon the rock of my word. And that's what we've been doing, is each week we're taking one of those stones, and together as a body of Christ, we're laying those stones into a foundational place. And the Holy Spirit has promised, and he's delivering on his, on his promise, he said, you lay the rock, you lay the foundation based on the stones of faith, and I'm going to create something so supernaturally significant in this place. It's going to blow your mind. And I'm going to share with you, and I asked him for permission, and I'm not going to call him out by name, but just an example of something tangible, because it's easy to say God's working, God's moving, but we want to see tangible evidence. I call them tangible bites of, of spiritual fruit. And, and one of the brothers had mentioned last week, we're out eating, and he says he had total hip replacement surgery seven years ago. And after that surgery, lost complete feeling in his right thigh. Was able to move, but he had no feeling. The doctor said, give it a couple weeks, the, the nerves will come back together. And a couple weeks go by, they said, give it a couple months and the nerves will come back together. Seven years later, this man is still walking around, with no feeling in his thigh. Last week, during worship, when the Holy Spirit was stirring and moving and, and revigorating and renewing and restoring, he said he started to feel a tingle in his leg and he made sure that it wasn't his cell phone in his pocket. And it wasn't. And then it got warm. And he stood up and he's, all right, you know, that's been seven years. And, and then, it, then it started to burn. And then he said he was worried he was having a stroke. And he wasn't. <laughs> the Holy, then he realized the Holy Spirit was revitalizing those nerves, connecting the tissues, bringing the nerves back together. As he stood there during worship and praise, the Holy Spirit was working a miracle. That's a tangible physical healing. There were so many people that we talked to after, the, after Sunday and throughout the week talking about the transformational messages that they've been receiving, the unlocking of, of, of old promises, right? We talked about in Ezekiel 55, 11, everything God says is purposeful and intentional with full expectation that it's going to come to fruition. And if we ever worry about, well, you know, I took a different path and I haven't been the best person or I've been a little disobedient, I'm too old, those promises never expire. They never expire. And, and neither does the possibility, the potential for physical healing as we experience. But it's because we're being obedient and laying these foundational stones of faith. We're going to continue to lay these foundational stones of faith as a family. And the, and the Holy Spirit is going to continue to create a supernatural atmosphere. I got to tell you, I'm wrecked. Last week, the Holy Spirit said, said Let's, we're going to take a right turn. And we did. And this week, he said, we're just going to, play, we're going to lay it all out. And he has. It has been so beautiful, so amazing. And look, and, and it's doesn't just, not just a worship. It was prayer this morning. It's watching our kids and y'all's kids come through that door and shoot up the stairs. Happy to be here. Y'all, I grew up, I never stepped foot in a church growing up. My family never brought us to a church. I grew up in darkness and abuse and violence. So I didn't know what it meant to be a kid in a church. I just knew all my Catholic friends, the kids down in South Louisiana going to catechism and, and talking about how much they hated it and everything. So my impression growing up as a, well, man, kids must really hate to be in church. What a bad place to bring kids. Until you realize that, that we're all part of the body, right? I mean, there's no Greek, there's no Jew, there's no slave, there's no free, there's no man, there's no woman, there's no adult, there's no child. We are all one in the body of Christ. And seeing those ones shoot up the stairs, with, with, with uh, smiling faces and expectation, 
Hallelujah for that. Hallelujah. That's the supernatural occurrence that's being stirred in this environment. Why? Because we're laying the foundation based on God's word. And based on those words, those stones that we've already laid, we started off with the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. If we're going we're gonna to walk, we're going to love, we're going to trust, we're going to live, we're going to spend eternity with, don't we want to know who it is we're spending it with? So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. After that, the next stone that we laid was God is revelation. How does God reveal himself to us? How does God speak? I mean, what kind of relationship do you have if it's not open communication? That was the second foundational stone. The next one we laid last week was creation. Not just what God makes, but why God made it. It's all for the expression of God's love. And today what we want to talk about is image. Image. The image of God. So we say, well, okay, like why do I want to know what God looks like? I got to tell you the truth. I want to know what God looks like so I can look like God. You know, my spiritual father, I've told you about Larry Titus. If a police sketch artist ever said, "Uh, Scott, can you describe Larry to me? I'd be like, oh, he looks like God. When I see Larry, I see the face of God. My prayer is that when, when our spouses see us, when our kids see us, when we see each other, that what we're looking at is the mirror reflection of the image of God. That's why it's important to know the image of God. Because I'm going to tell you what, just like discipleship, we're all being discipled by something or somebody. It's the same thing for image. Look, the, the, the glamour magazine, the health, the fitness, the body, uh, all this stuff, multi-billion dollar industry every year. Magazines, cosmetics, commercials, shows, everything, right? And we want to look like them and we want to walk like them. We want to drive what they drive. We don't know nothing about them and they don't know nothing about us. Yet we give every, billions of dollars a year to look like somebody we know nothing about. Why? Because the image is appealing. So we figure if we want to up our game, better ourselves, then my image should reflect their image because they live a beautiful, perfect life. And that's a lie. That's a lie. I'm going to tell you, When I was in high school, MTV just launched. I mean, I know our kids, whatever, that's old school. Look, in my small Louisiana town, there was no cable. And the people who did have cable weren't interested in MTV. But look, there was one family. I couldn't tell you that kid's name, but I can tell you where they lived. I can tell you what their living room looked like back in the early 80s. I can tell you the 60 and 70 stinky kids every day after school and on the weekends just glued to the tube. Glued to the tube watching MTV. MTV. Pop culture was feeding our minds with an image that wasn't from God. And look, y'all, then I was about, I was a 225-pound outside linebacker getting ready to go play some serious college football. But you know what I wanted? I didn't want a full scholarship. I wanted some red parachute pants. <laughs> I wanted some MC Hammer red parachute pants. And Leah said, the first week you got to sing Al Green. She said, if you dare, hammer time. I am leaving you. But you see, we're all susceptible to image, right? And look, God's good. God's good. I'm going to tell y'all, I searched. If if you could imagine what my town looked like, you could have a better appreciation, especially back in the 80s. Like, I went to every strip mall in deep south Cajun country, Louisiana, asking mom and pops, y'all got some of them parachute pants? Look, God's good. Because he kept those parachute pants off this body. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. Ah. But we're all being influenced by image. By image. And and in that image comes a reflection of our identity. So I want to ask you, just self-reflective, don't don't call it out. But I just I want you to just just kind of close in for a second. And, and think of what one word best describes you. 
Now stop and lock it in. If it wasn't a good word, don't change it. If it was an incredible word, uh, fantastic word, cling to it. Don't add a hyphen in other words because in your cheating, I want you to take the one word that, that was came up that surfaced in your mind and I just want you to hold on to it for the course of this message. Because that one word is life-shaping. Good or bad, that one word, if it's not based on the image of God, can, can, can become the foundational stone. And then, then we start adding to our image of where we work, what we do, who we marry, what we drive. All these other things shape our image. Even just our perception of who we are. Even if it's a lie, it's our image. And it's grounded in often that one word. We still struggle with that simple question, who am I? Instead of saying, whose am I? You see, that'll answer everything. So I want to give you an example of a fellow that we're probably all familiar with who had no doubt in who he was or proclaiming who he was. And you may, you may recognize the quote, and it's, I am what I am, and that's all what I am. That pop out a sailor man. Now you think, that's a confident fellow. I am what I am, and that's all what I am. You're thinking, that guy knows who he is. That guy's got a deep appreciation for sense of self. His identity was rooted in that self-proclamation. Let me give you another scripture, another verse, another verse. And it doesn't come from Popeye, but it comes from Paul. In his 1 Corinthians 15.10, it says, But because of God's grace, that is what I am. And his grace that he gave me was not wasted. I worked harder than all the other apostles, but I was not really the one working. It was God's grace that was working in me. You see, two different perspectives, both fully, completely understood their image, their identity. One, you want to say, well, that's just a cartoon character, but I venture to say he's probably more like us than Paul's like us, or we're like Paul. You see, where Popeye got his affirmation from a rusty spinach can and a pursuit over some girl that, that, that he was never going to capture. I never watched the end of the series. I don't know if they got married in the end. But how many of us find our self-affirmation and our self-proclamation? Well, I am what I am. God made me this way. And, and, and all we are is based on who we are. It comes from a rusted can of spinach, some external influence, as opposed to what God says. You see, that is what I am. What you are has nothing to do with your red parachute pants. It has nothing to do with what you drove over here. It has nothing to do where you work or who you married or how much you make or how many followers on social media. All that is what you are is but by the grace of God. And I just challenge you to... to, to to not look for affirmation and identity and image in a rusty can of spinach. Whatever that can of spinach is, it could be money, success, alcohol, drugs, addictions. Seek your image based on the grace of God. You know, I want to tell you, that one word that I asked you to, to lock in, and if it's not a positive word, we're going to work through that. But I want to share you. I'm going to tell you my word that shaped my life a long, long time ago. So I grew up on the bayous. And listen, where I lived, it was, a, it was all cane field, sugar cane. And there was a gravel road cut down the middle, and there was a couple houses on each side. And that's where I grew up. And look, back in the 70s, I love the $6 million man. I love Steve Austin. Look, I'd run around, you know, I'd try to pick it up and my eye would be looking and now they call it a, a creeper peeper Tom. But I mean, I was like, boop, 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 my bionic eye. And, and look, I love Steve Austin and I acted like Steve Austin and I pretended to be a $6 million man and I tried to dress like him and everything. That was my image because that's what I idolized, you know. And one Christmas, uh, I got this, my folks gave me that red track suit with the white stripes. This is the 70s, man. I mean, it was a fire engine red tracksuit with white stripes. 
And y'all, I wore it everywhere. I wore it that Christmas day and down in the bayous, it was Christmas is usually 90 degrees, 100% humidity and rain. But I didn't care, man. I had my $6 million suit on. And one day we're standing on the, you know, standing out with my boys on the, on the gravel road. And, and, and I don't, <laughs> I don't mean boys, like we're a gang or something. I mean, we're like kids, you know, like me and the, the other young guys, you know, and we're just, we're cutting it up. I don't want to make it sound like I was tough, but, um, but we're cutting it up. We're laughing. My friends are, you know, uh, that's back in the day when you had to ride your bicycle to see if your friends were home and then actually talk to each other without holding a phone in your hand. It's really weird. And I know we're understanding, and they're up there like, y'all are really weird. Um, <laughs> but y'all were out there, and all of a sudden, my friends, like, stop cutting up. They stop laughing, and they get quiet. And I hear, hey, idiot, in that red suit, I'm talking to you. That was my dad. And all my friends put their heads down. And they disappeared down that gravel road. They disappeared into the cane field. And I carried that word idiot with me for years. I spent years of my childhood, even in, in, in abuse and, and violence, trying to prove that I was not an idiot. Look, I was a good student. I was smart. I, I was a good athlete. I, I was a mama's boy, and I was proud of it. I loved my mom. I didn't care. And I did everything I could to prove to my dad um, that I was not an idiot. And you know, it didn't matter. Even, even when he passed away six years ago, it still didn't matter. But I let that word idiot define me, stamp me. And it wasn't until uh, uh, I come to know the love of Christ, but by the grace that I understand that I wasn't an idiot, that I was loved, that I was valued. That's how destructive that one word can be. Now I'll tell you, I took that, I took that red jumpsuit, tracksuit, and I quietly stuffed it to the bottom of a garbage can. And I got rid of that tracksuit. But that word idiot laid stamped on me for a long time. So I want to tell you, I want to ask you, I want to assure you, you'll never know the full joy of Jesus Christ, of God, if you're not living his image, if you're accepting somebody else's word, anything outside of the word of God is a lie. If you're one word that you locked in, if you could not imagine those words coming off of Jesus's lips, if you cannot find that one word, that description in the word of God, it's a lie. Look, there's no neutral ground. There's no median. You're either believing the word of God, you're pursuing the image of God, you're reflecting the image of God, or you're not. And the other, the opposition, not that the devil's equal to him, but he's in opposition to him. You're living for the world. You're believing the world. You're living, trying to look like the world. And that's got nothing to do with God. I want to challenge you to pursue that one word that God's got for your life. And if you say, well, where do I find that word? Well, we talked about it through Revelation, how God reveals himself. It's in God's word. It's in the Bible. And the Bible does two main things. It tells us who God is. And it tells us who we are. So if you want to cash in that one negative word for what God feels about you, right, based on God's image, go to, the, go to the word of God. Y'all, I'm going to tell you that any revelation that is not from God is fake, is self-created, and Satan celebrated. Can you imagine how happy Satan was the day that my dad said, idiot, and that word sunk into my spirit? Can you imagine how, how the celebration that Satan had? Knowing, thinking, imagining that someday this fellow's gonna, gonna wind up outside of Dallas, Texas, sharing the word of God to everybody he comes across, whether it's at the gym or the Walmart or the grocery store or in this building. Like, like back then, with that red tracksuit on the side of a gravel road, can you imagine the celebration that the devil was having? Because I allowed that word idiot to define me. Y'all, don't let, don't let any word other than the word of God define your image. We're going to break that off today. And this morning began that with the stirring of the Holy Spirit. Y'all, so we say, 
Well, that's great. I understand. We're the image of God. I get it. I get it. I get it. Give me something tangible. Give me some proof, right? Show me. Show me. Well, it's simple. Let's go to Genesis 1, 26, 27. It doesn't get any more clear than this. And this is right from the beginning and intentional. And, and it says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. I got to tell you, if you believe in God, and more importantly, you believe God, then you've got to believe that his word is true. We've said it before. You may not understand everything in the, in the Bible, but it doesn't make it untrue. The Bible's not a salad bar. The word of God's not a salad bar. You cannot pick and choose what you want and what you'll discard. So if, you're, if, you'll, if you'll admit that you're willing to admit that the word of God is 100% true and accurate, then let's start off with this, that we were created in his image. I mean, we can stop right there. We can stop asking, who am I? What am I supposed to be? What what does this world mean? Boom. We were created in his image. You're not an idiot. You're not a loser. You're not dumb. You're not a failure. You were the image of God. And I want to just, I want to share a couple of things. In relation, because you can unpack the, uh, Genesis 1 26, 27. You can unpack it all day. But you know, we talk about who God is in the Trinity, and it's obvious. Let us in our. That's plurality. One God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But you know, I always, I always tell people, I'm like, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Now, if you're hanging with the Holy Spirit, if you're hanging with the Son and the Father, if you're hanging with God, that's three pretty good uh, influences right there. There's another question I, I like to ask when I talk to men. It's like, who's your five? It's a sociological construct that says, you are, you'll become the aggregate of the five people closest to you. You want to be a knucklehead? Hang out with knuckleheads. You want to be successful? Hang around with successful people. So you think five people is all it takes to influence you. So if you're, talk, if you're hanging with the Trinity, that's three out of five right there. Chances are amazing, right? That's who you're going to become. That's who you're going to associate yourself with. You know, talking about God's image and, and, and God's giving us the dominion over all things, it doesn't mean to, to abuse or dominate It's to have dominion over. It's to rule over. Kingship is in our DNA as sons and daughters of Christ. God gives us that. And and that's part of his image. Part of God's image, if you're reflecting God's image, is to to image kingship, rulership. But I got to tell you, but you got to look like God before you can act like God. It's easy to dominate and abuse anything. But if you, truly want to, if you truly want to proclaim that promise, that affirmation in who your image is, your image after God who created you, and you want to have dominion and rulership and kingship, you've got to look like God. And how do you look like God? By, by uh, replicating, mirroring the image of God, the characteristics of God, the nature of God. When you get that, then you get to rule and have kingship. God's not playing around with this. God created everything, and then he gave it to us to take care of. And we've done a pretty cruddy job. But it's never too late. It's never too late. You know, the thing that I love, and because uh, Richard and Sherry Bright are going to be here next week, um, is that that when God talks about made him... uh, man and woman, and, that, and they were equal. And I want to make sure that we understand that, that there's a difference between leadership and headship. Leadership, you and your spouse, you're both equal. Different, 
but equal. God had to create us different to, to fulfill the order to multiply, right? Just from a physiological standpoint, we had to be different. But we're equal. And I want to share the, 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 the verse that, that speaks to that. Um, and it's Galatians 3.28. I referenced it earlier. But, but in this context, showing the, 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 equal, the equality of leadership, it says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free, nor their male and female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. You and your spouse are equal. Each have different gifts, different talents you bring to the team. Not everybody can throw the football. Not everybody can block. Equal. Now, headship is where, like when I talk to men a lot of times, and we go marriage counseling, couples, headship, sometimes they, they, it's a little harder for them to accept. Because men... Because of headship, you are uh, God-ordained, gender-assigned, spiritual head of your family. That means you can't tell your wife or ask your wife, well, why don't you just pray for us? Why don't you take the kids to church? Why don't you help them read the Bible? Look, you don't have to carry all the load, but you are the spiritual head of your family. And being the spiritual head doesn't mean you get to dominate. You get to control what it means is you get to act like Jesus, the way he laid himself down for the church. But men, I'm going to tell you, if you are not serving, standing, leading as the spiritual head of your family, your family's going to find itself in a, in a crooked posture. Look, years, years, years ago, when Lee and I were, 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 were really working things out, you know, and, and God, we had a good prayer life. But hers was over here, and mine was over there. And we're like, oh, we're doing a good prayer life. And Jesus is like, are y'all praying together? And I'm like, you mean in the same house? He goes, no, are you clinging and cleaving and praying together? And I'm like, no, no, we'll start that. We'll start that. It took us about six months. Six months. And, and look, I kept telling, I asked Lee, I'm like, why don't you get started? I'll jump in, you know, and because you're articulate. I mean, you're a creative person. And, and she's like, Scott, that's your responsibility. And look, I struggled. I struggled. You know why I struggle? Because, and most men do, because number one, we don't sound like Billy Graham. We're afraid we're going to sound dumb in front of our wives. We may not know a lot of scripture to, to espouse while we're praying. And another thing was, I was afraid I was going to say something stupid. Maybe tell on myself. Maybe reveal something. Maybe a weakness was going to come out. And, and the first time we did, it was my dad's funeral. And it was so much grief and relief. I got to be honest, it was so abusive. Uh, there was a sense of relief when he passed away. He had been sick for a long time. And, and, and we went back to Louisiana for the funeral. And I'm laying over Leah's body. Uh, she, I made it sound. I'm laying over Leah, and I'm just talking, and I'm saying, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I can't face this. I, I just, I can't. I can't. And, and that turned into to just crying out in prayer and making myself vulnerable. And it was about an hour that we laid there, and she was quiet because she realized that her husband finally accepted the mantle of being the spiritual head of his family. So we went to the funeral, and, and, and that day was the first day. And all the years since then, we continue every day, every day, all day, praying. And it's my responsibility. Men, it's your responsibility. If you're not praying with your wife, I'm begging you, start praying with your wife. It'll change your prayer language. It'll change the way you talk to your wife, to your kids, to your friends, to your neighbors. Don't worry about sounding dumb. God knows your heart. Just speak the words. Your wife needs to hear your words. And, and, and I want to I share this one little thing. And I always encourage women. So in the creation story, Adam seems to get a lot of the play, a lot of the face time. You know, we all know that, that God created him and, and, and breathed life into his nostrils. And when his eyes opened, he's face to face with God. And, and then God gave him a cool job taking care of everything and, and let him name all the stuff. And then when it comes to woman, you know, it's like, uh, pull the rib out of Adam. There's Adam again, stealing the show. And boom, now we got woman. And it just always seemed like, well, if we're equal, like where's her time on stage, you know? And, and years ago, the Holy Spirit really convicted me. And, he, and, and it was that 
The Bible doesn't say how long Adam was asleep. Now, you figure it was for a while to heal, but it doesn't say how long he was asleep. And in that time, it was simply woman and God the Father. And I believe that was woman's opportunity to see the gold standard of how they're supposed to be treated uh, uh, by, by their husband, by their dad, by other men. I believe that that was the opportunity for, for God to set that seal, set that stamp in woman's life going forward. That it's important for women to spend time alone with God the Father. It's important for women to look at the standard of God the Father as the way that they're to be treated by their husbands and their kids and other people in their lives. So I want to encourage you women, you ladies, that I know you get, you get wrapped up taking care of your husband, your kids, your job, your house remodels, all this stuff. I'm asking you, I'm asking you, self-care. Take the time to spend the time with just you and the Father. Just you and the Father. It was a standard set in the beginning. It's the standard that never changes because God's word never changes. I just want to ask you ladies to make that commitment. It's always funny, you, you folks that we all know each other, Holy Spirit, all right, now shut up, Scott. Uh, and this is one of those moments. Uh, I believe that I've, that I've shared what God's asked me to share. And, uh, and I would, are we going wor- to close it with worship? If we could have worship, come back up. And, and while they're doing that, I, I want to pray over you because I really do. I, the Holy Spirit is stirring and he's created an atmosphere uh, for healing and for restoration. Uh, he, he's, re- he's, he's stirred an atmosphere where he wants you to know Your one word, if it was anything other than the word from God, if it's anything other than the word that Jesus would have whispered and when he walked on this earth, if it's any word other than the word that you find in the word of God, that that word is fake, that word is counterfeit, that word is from the devil. God is telling you, God is asking you, God is giving you permission right now to break that word off, to proclaim that that word is nothing but a lie and that word no longer has uh, has control over you or has any kind of compulsion over you, that that word, that one word, if it's a negative word, if it's anything other than a word that would have come out of the mouth of God himself, that word is a lie. You were wonderful. You were, you, were, you were amazing. You were loved. You were special because you are the image of God. God wants you to start walking in that image. And in that image comes kingship, comes dominion, comes power, comes authority. My prayer is that, you, is that you break that negative word that was put on your life and you receive, you receive, you receive the positive affirmation that God has for you. You're his child. He's crazy about you. And he wants you to know it. He wants you to live it. And he wants it reflected in your face and in your walk. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father God, thank you. Thank you, thank you for this atmosphere today. Thank you, Father God. We praise you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.